Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Alexander Patron. Dr. Patron is VP CMIO at Wellspan Health and a practicing pediatrician for more than 20 years. Prior to joining Wellspan, Dr. Patron was VP CMIO at Solution Health, an integrated health system with Southern New Hampshire Health and Elliott Health System, and CMIO at Elliott Health System. He received his medical degree from the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine, completed his pediatric residency with Atlantic Health, and obtained his MBA from the University of Massachusetts. Dr. Patron, Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me. It's amazing having you on the show today. You have such a unique journey and background. Like I mentioned in the bio, a practicing pediatrician for over 20 years and leading informatics. I'm really curious to start the conversation. What was your initial spark to get into medicine? So yeah, that, that spark is actually what kind of carried me to the journey I'm at right now, just to keep it brief for the sake of time. In college, I went to college in Connecticut. I had the dream of being a physician. It was from the onset, I wanted to be a physician. While I was in college, my family, I had an uncle who was a surgeon. My father was very into technology and technology industries. They were like, you're crazy for becoming a physician. This was 89, I graduated college. So it was the late 80s. You're crazy for becoming a physician. Computers, computer science, that's where you need to be. You know, you're, you're a bright kid. Don't waste it on medicine. Go into computer science. It's the wave of the future. I know you don't see it now, but it's the wave of the future. So I sort of listened to them and I still had a degree in biology when I graduated. However, I had dabbled in computer science and computer science classes and probably took enough to be dangerous. And interestingly, I took some artificial intelligence classes yeah. and some others, which in 1980s talk was very different than it is today. Graduated college and then decided to go into information systems consulting rather than medical school out of the gate. I was there about two years in information system consulting, and I was absolutely miserable. Yeah. It is not what I wanted to do in life. It just was very clear to me. And then the consulting company that I was on, although I was making good money and it was challenging work, it just was not my core of my being. My core of my being was being a physician. They put me on a healthcare client, developing the DSM codes back then and translating them using COBOL into computer language so they could be used by the psychiatrist. That being on a healthcare setting and doing a programming in healthcare, I said, I have a physician's my calling. I really like, this is fine, but I really need to be a physician. Went to medical school at that time in the early 90s. And then from there, after graduating medical school, I joined a pediatric residency in New Jersey. And that's where the two started to come together. And we can kind of talk about that a little okay. later. Okay. That's great. I'm curious, given your background in consulting first, and then you developed a pediatric hospitalist program for Atlantic Health. That was one of your first ventures into the system. You got involved with their system-wide EMR rollout as a physician leader. I'm curious, what did you learn from that initial experience? And then why did you continue down the informatics path? So that was interesting because it didn't take me long after graduating residency to be a pediatric hospitalist. So remember, this is the late 90s, maybe approaching 2000. Even pediatric hospitals was something new. <laughs> Informatics didn't exist really in the average healthcare setting. Many organizations were still on paper at that time. And when I became the head of the hospitalist program, was starting to cut my teeth as a hospitalist, the organization at that time trans started to transition away from paper orders to, well, you could see how the journey evolves, electronic orders. And they said, does anyone here have any computer background? And hello, here I am with some background in computer science, having done information systems consulting. They said, Alex, you're tapped to lead the rollout of our computerized order entry initiative in the children's hospital. Well, next thing you know, we knocked it out of the park, had a tremendous rollout. And they said, Alex, can you help us with the next one and the next one and the next one? And the term CMIO didn't exist at the time. And next, you know, I'm learning the skills to be an informaticist and cut my teeth, which after a few years ended up transitioning to the role of what they call director of medical informatics, and then ultimately to chief medical information officer. So it was an awesome experience because it actually brought my two journeys together. 
uh, the joy of being a pediatrician, taking care of people, and that genuine love, but also that intellectual curiosity and interest and natural aptitude in computer science. Now I think I've found my true calling, which blended them together, you know, 20 some, 25 years later into being both a practicing pediatrician and a chief medical information officer. So it's awesome. Awesome journey. So it's, uh, it's, it's your funny. uncle, uncle and family happy today? Yes. Very happy. <laughs> very, very, yeah. Very yeah. happy. I think I've <laughs> blended both worlds. Yeah. Quite nicely. I, I was going to say, it's, it's funny that um, you were miserable being a, an IT consultant. And, and clearly what was missing was just the, the medicine piece. So if, if you were a medicine IT consultant, maybe you'd be super happy. It's, it's kind of what yes. you are now in some ways. So that's, that's I was really... being intellectually challenged. Programming <laughs> COBOL is not easy to do. And uh, I was intellectually challenged, but I wasn't passionately satisfied and passionately challenged. And that's what was missing from my life. And you should follow anybody who's listening to this should follow those voices inside of you because it's amazing how they can carry you in directions you never thought otherwise. And we always tell people prepare for, for careers that don't exist yet. I'm a classic example of that. When I went to medical school, no one even knew this career existed. But yeah, when you follow your heart and your passions, you'd be amazing in how it all materializes. That's amazing. It kind of reminds me of right now with all of the uh, like uh, large language models and the chat GPT craze. People are half joking that in the future, you know, they're going to be prompt engineers where, you know, the real skill is going to be how do you get the language model to actually execute on the right sort of action, but you have to get the prompt right. Probably will be something. That exactly. Exactly. It'd be amazing how those lessons can uh, tie into, you know, what's coming down the road. <laughs> Definitely. So, so you actually went on at some point to do your MBA and take on more and more leadership roles in Atlantic Health. And, you know, not too many CMIOs actually go and get their MBA as well. So just curious, why did you get your MBA? And then how has that shaped how you lead as a CMIO? Yeah, so that that's actually a very good question because I, when I was well into my informatics journey, I started to realize physicians are natural leaders by the fact that you're carrying a patient through their healthcare struggles. And you could potentially be leading an all office, but they don't necessarily, or I never had the, 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 the traditional skills in business, business administration, being able to speak with the C-suite, understand finance, read a balance sheet, understand marketing, strategy, traditional strategic initiatives. And when you're in large healthcare institutions, you have to understand those structures in order to be successful as a leader. It's very difficult as just following traditional physician training to navigate those waters. So getting an MBA was eye-opening for me. It allowed me to navigate the C-suite ways I never could have before. Um, this was around, you know, 2010 or so, give or take. And it was great to have had that opportunity because it, again, it's carried my career in directions it would not have otherwise. So I strongly encourage to get some tradition, it doesn't have to be an MBA, but some traditional business training if you're looking to be an administrator, because it does allow you to speak the speak, walk the walk, and carry the credentials you need on the administrative side, in addition to the ones that just come naturally from your healthcare training. I'm uh, curious, like having your MBA, did that kind of change, for example, like day to day, like, are you now asking questions like, wait, what's the cost structure of this? Or is this actually a, a profitable part of the organization? Like, are those questions that you're asking now, like way more frequently than you, than you were before? Or? Absolutely. The big one, which drives my team nuts. And I learned this literally first year of business school. And I say it almost weekly is if you can't measure it, you cannot manage it. And I say that to my teams again and again. We're not managing this. We're struggling because we don't have a, we don't either have the right measure or we're not measuring it. You cannot manage large scale structures without measurements. Some people think they can do it intuitively or by the seat of their pants. And yeah, sometimes you get lucky and sometimes that might carry you through a part of the journey, but it all comes down to the KPIs, the measurements, how you're managing your structures. So part of my wellspan journey has been to transition the team to a more data-driven, analytic-driven, measure-driven organization where we look at why do we not have resources in a particular area? What about a particular project is going right or wrong? And to focus on the measurements. So that's probably the biggest item. But again, reading a balance sheet, understanding finance, how, how the revenue cycle teams work, just it's, it's a slightly different mindset than a, a traditional physician would have. 
And having that knowledge has been incredibly helpful. But the one nugget is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I drill that into my teams weekly. I love and, that. and on that note, since let's say 2022, ha- has there been a change in like certain KPIs that yeah. are prioritized or being measured that maybe weren't pre-2022? Yeah. So at the beginning, it was more uh, traditional measures. Now we're moving much more to outcomes measures. <laughs> And really trying to, t- it's not easy, but trying to look at outcomes as your true measurement rather than just hierarchical measures or other measures. And it's a lot more challenging, but definitely worth it because if you're not using outcomes measures, it's hard to truly understand if what you're measuring is actually achieving what you want. You'd be amazed at your team's ability to meet your measure, even though you're not actually meeting your outcome. So that's probably the biggest change in the last few years is more outcomes driven uh, measurement structures. In terms of like when you think about measuring success or, or metrics from a clinical informatics point of view, I'm curious, like let's say you roll out some new module or some new initiative for your clinicians from, a, from an IT perspective. How do you kind of coach your teams on, on measuring and tracking success? Like, Is it the number percentage of clinicians that actually use that function or time spent? Or I'm just curious like how you think about measuring success from a clinical informatics point of view. Yeah. So one of the challenges is I'll just send an example. It just happens to be in my head. It's not necessarily the best example, but with provider well-being and in-basket burnout and managing their in-basket, initially the team was looking at reducing these number, these amount of messages coming to this folder. And like I, I told the team, I could easily reduce the number of patient messages coming to providers. Go to my chart, go to the patient portal and shut off patient messages. I can achieve that measure very easily. Is it the outcome I want? Absolutely not. So I challenge the team not to just say we want to reduce the number of messages going to a particular folder, but let's look at the outcomes and how much time are providers spending? And can we measure the actual time spent in that and maybe some provider well-being measures and tee it up with our provider well-being initiatives to, to run the two in parallel. Yeah. So what they're doing, if there's a measurable component there, that we can look at the outcome to overall satisfaction as opposed to just reducing a number of measures and having it achieving it, but again, maybe actually taking a step backwards in terms of outcomes. Okay. Yeah, I love that. It, I understand what you mean by that's trickier to measure because in a lot of cases, You kind of have to go back to the whiteboard and really draw up what are the real problems that we're looking at solving and then how do we attach an outcome to that. I'm curious, Alex, what advice would you give to other physicians looking to get into more of leadership roles and and taking that path for their careers? So that's it. So to one, be humble. Don't don't realize this is not much, much of this does not come naturally to people, that it's a learned skill. Find a mentor, find somebody you click with that you kind of get and try to hook up with a mentor. And it, in parallel with that in an organization, if you're blessed with that opportunity, run with it because it's it's great because that's how you really can learn the skills needed to be a successful leader. And then do not shy away from more traditional learning structures like business school or master's in medical management type courses and structures, because when you combine the two together, I think it's critical, but don't just think it's going to happen naturally or organically and just kind of go through it. You need to be a lot more structured, a lot more methodical. And again, if I had to say one word, find a mentor. I've had multiple mentors over my life from chairs of departments, non-traditional mentors, other physician leaders, and uh, it's been a great journey, but it's through that mentorship that I'm here where I am today. Me on that note, I think a lot of kind of up and comers if they haven't gone to mention before, they're, they're not really sure, how do I ask how, and, and how do I get them to say yes? So when you're making the pitch, like, are, are you are you just asking for, for guidance and maybe it evolves into a real mentoring relationship or are you formally asking them, hey, can you be my mentor? Like, how do you advise folks on-, on yeah, You don't just walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know, can, will you be my mentor? It's you ask, you ask when you have a passion for what you're doing, you ask questions, you get involved, and you develop relationships with the person through projects. At Atlantic Health, at the very beginning of my career, this is well before I was even a director of informatics, I was with the C-suite and I, through some probing questions and some intellectual curiosity, I found myself on the, the patient safety team of the organization. And I'm in there just intellectually inquisitive, passionate about what I'm doing. 
And it's through that that you develop the relationships to be able to get towards that mentorship program. But it doesn't just happen. Some organizations have a more structured approach. And if that exists, great, take advantage of it. You know, if they have uh, leadership pathways and programs and structures, seek them out, ask questions and take advantage of them. Our organization, we're blessed that they do have those more formal structures and pathways. But if you don't, just don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Ask the probing questions. Show that you're interested and you'll be amazed at where it gets you. Makes total sense. Switching gears a little bit, last fall, I had the pleasure of, of hearing you speak at the 2022 like Time Fall Forum. And you know, one of the things you said was to the effect of that your dream was to, to get rid of the keyboard and mouse from the, the patient room. And you wanted to build an office environment around the provider and the patient interaction. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on, on what your, your vision is for the room, for the patient? Yeah. Room? So this is where you see me light up a little more because this is my passion. This is taking my, my love of healthcare, my love of being a physician, and my intellectual curiosity and interest in technology and kind of marrying them together where the rubber meets the road. There is nothing more discerning as a physician than have to turn either your back on a patient or your eye away from a patient to go to a screen to either do data entry or to use a keyboard or a mouth, which in my opinion, language, touch, using your senses are natural human factor components. Typing on a keyboard may be a great skill. It's a learned skill and some people are very facile at it. But by definition, I think it distracts from that genuine patient-physician relationship. And then a little bit less so, but on that same genre is the mouse. Once you're grabbing a mouse and you're looking at a computer screen, either to do data entry or to find what you need to be able to care for the patient, you're inherently moving away from that true interaction. Whereas if you could start to leverage, and we're just beginning that journey now, and uh, it's going to be awesome to see over the next few years, either using ambient technologies, which I'm um, blessed with the organization being very supportive of and moving forward very aggressively with ambient technologies or generative type AI technologies like everyone's talking about today with the various modalities and leveraging those to remove the keyboard, remove the mouse, and to start recording, documenting, and interacting in a way that's more natural for the patient provider relationship. So you're actually touching the patient, talking with the patient, communicating with the patient in a more natural way, rather than achieving the same outcome, but typing, searching with a mouse, clicking. Now, getting the keyboard and the mouse out of the exam room, and I may not see it in my lifetime, I may, but ultimately my true north, my vision is in that direction. So every click, every initiative, if I remove one click, or I remove one need for a physician to turn their back and go to the keyboard. Each one of those is a journey in the right direction, a journey towards my true north. So I'm not naive to say I'm going to get rid of the keyboard and the mouse. I get it, but that's the true north. And everything we do should carry us that. And if we're doing something that moves in the opposite direction, BPA, new decision support, we have to have a damn good reason to do it. And it has to go through all the five whys. Why are we doing it? 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 Getting down to the root cause. Because many times if you spend that extra effort, you can actually find other ways to embed it in the workflow and not necessarily have to have an HCC BPA fire to remind the person to enter an HCC code or you know acknowledge something that's on the problem list. There are much harder ways of doing it but they're embedding them either into the technology itself or embedding it into the workflow. Not always successful. We have lots of VPAs, lots of intrusions. We're not there, but again, it's my journey and it's my passion. But before we dive into some of the work that you're already doing on this at, at Wallspan, I'm just curious, when you make that pitch internally to other clinicians, is it a very easy pitch? Or despite the fact that most people probably don't love documentation, there are still a number of clinicians who just don't want to change because of the inertia created through the status quo. I'm just wondering like how much pushback you actually do get with your yeah, So you, you don't get pushback conceptually. The okay. idea, if somebody's pushing back, something's wrong, but there's a big, but they're very skeptical. Skeptics, they get it conceptually, but they're skeptical in reality. Yeah. And if you make these journeys and they don't work or they go backwards, 
or you try a new technology and it actually is more frustrating, it's very easy to lose them. Going through the, you know, the change management component, that whole change management there, it's very quick to take step backwards. So you have to be careful and you have to do it in a way that's additive because if it's initially perceived as additive, but the experience is a negative one, it's very, very hard to recover from that. You can, but it takes time. So that's the challenge is the reality versus the, the, the conceptual buy-in. And it's a great insight. I mean, when you're rolling out new innovative things that that impact the clinician workflow, you only get so many shots on goal. So you kind of want to make sure your, your first shot is really, really on, on the mark. Yes. You, know, you mentioned asking why five times is so profoundly important because it really does get to that root problem. And then you can center the conversation around that. Maybe it is a conceptual approach on a new initiative that we're trying, but at least it is centered around their actual why. I'd love to dive in a little bit to learn what you've been doing at Wellspan regarding Ambient Voice. What was sort of the impetus for going down that route? And then what have been some of your learnings so far? Yep. So full disclosure, I've been at Wellspan just shy of a year. And I came to it because of their journey towards one of, one of them being Ambient Technologies and their adoption of technology and the overall organization attitude towards implementing new technologies. That's what attracted me through my relationships in the industry. There was an opportunity here and I gravitated towards. So their ambient journey was not mine to establish. That was the vision of a, the CIO of the organization and his journey. But being a part of it now, it's awesome. Absolutely awesome. It's the move towards the providers. We have hundreds of providers using it. Roughly 20 a month is our goal to keep adding. And not it's not for everybody. It's a tool. It's not nirvana. There's challenges. Then you, you realize who it's right for and who it is and over time. But the overall sense is, wow, you're changing my world. You're getting me home at night. You're saving my marriage. You know, all those comments have come forth from providers. You are uh, allowing me to interact with my patients. And then when you survey the patients, it's pretty, you know, my provider is actually paying attention to me. They're no longer staring at the computer screen. You know, they're, they're more engaged in the patient relationship, even though the provider may not actually be more engaged in the physician's head or the APP's advanced practice provider's head. They may be the same engagement, but the perception of the patients is very different. The perception is the, the clinician is more engaged in their healthcare journey. Okay. What actually, uh, and maybe this, and this is before you, you know, when you started there, um, maybe it's not relevant, but even like right now, like when you think about adding 20 new clinicians per month, how are you finding the right ones? Like, how are you assessing like who's most likely to be part of the 20 to adopt next month? Who's most likely to be on board? How, how do you decide that? Yep. So number one is you have to identify those physicians. So initially it's being focused on primary care and medical wow. special, not inpatient. That's a challenge to do it in those environments just by the nature of the work. And then those providers who are struggling, who are having a difficult time documenting their notes, who after interviewing them and talking with them want to try something new and different, and you show it to them. And some people go, that's not for me. I don't want that. And that's fine. You know, it's not, it's a tool. It's not designed for everybody. And there are actually... Clinicians who have just learned so well to, to use the inherent tools of an EMR, whether they're natural or not, to that person, they work. And they're getting through their day, and they're not burnt out from that, because they may be burnt out for other reasons, but not burnt out for that. And it's finding that, that marriage, that, that clinician who's struggling, who's having difficulty specifically with their clinical documentation, and who has a lot of pajama time and those sorts of things writing their notes and cleaning up their documentation and saying, here, try this. Again, we focus on primary care and the medical specialties, and less so on the inpatient unit, et cetera. But as so far, it's actually worked out very well. And those clinicians love it and they're testaments to using it. And it works well. Is the technology perfect? Absolutely not. Does it require human intervention at the end? Yes. But again, it's the beginning of a journey. It's <laughs> the first step to say, I'm going to wait till it's fully mature is not I don't think appropriate. It's seeing the vision, seeing the future and getting there. And the fully automated modes exist. They're not as common right now, but they do exist. And they didn't exist a year ago. And a year from now, it'll be a totally different animal. 
And it's all part of that technology journey and change management. You mentioned kind of the big value propositions that have been around improving the staff experience and reducing pajama time, as well as enhancing the patient experience and, and the clinical encounter. I'm curious, are those now things that you sort of, um, I guess, market to step for staff recruitment and retention or for trying to bring more patients to the system? Because those sound like fantastic outcomes, but sometimes those benefits aren't always, I guess, communicated to the outside world. Is that something that's part of the, the marketing strategy now or, or not? Yes. Yep. Yep. If you Google our organization and look for ambient technologies, you'll see videos and testaments and survey results around our use of ambient technologies and how they benefited our patients, how they benefited our clinicians. It's all part of that. Yeah, because it strikes me that, especially right now in, in, in the environment with um, kind of the, the staff burnout and stuff, how you leverage technology to improve the staff experience could be a, a differentiator for the health system going forward. And, and, and those who realize that and actually make that part of their retention recruitment strategy are, are going to be successful. And others who, who fall behind years from now are going to realize probably their mistake and not, not you know, using that actually to, to keep folks high functioning in the organization. So. Oh, I agree. It's uh, those organizations who are adopting this now are going to, in my opinion, be way ahead of the curve going forward. Because if you're not and you wait, it's going to be very hard to catch up. My humble opinion, very hard to catch up after the fact. So agreed. Even though it may be a little more challenging now because yeah. the technology is where it is, but chat GPT or ambient technologies, you know, it's 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 here and it's the future. Definitely. Yeah. That's great. So Alex, another outcome that we've heard in the past around ambient voices, oh, uh, you know, increasing patient throughput. But I know you've talked in the past about how it's not really there to increase patient throughput. Like you've mentioned, it's for documentation and satisfaction of clinicians and the provider interaction. But could you unpack that learning a little bit? Yeah, so therein lies the rub, and that goes back to the conversation we had about my business background and my MBA. This is much easier to sell to an organization when it's around an ROI <laughs> and improving throughput and improving revenue. And you can do that because you don't need to see many patients a day extra to justify the cost of the technology. However, if you go into a provider who needs it for well-being, and pajama time, and and you say, here's the technology, but you have to see X number okay. of patients a day, you've just put another nail in that particular provider. And you have not, a, yes, you have pushed it forward because you drove what a core part of a organization may want it for, but you've not solved the problem. Now, if that is the only way you can introduce the technologies through a hard ROI, then you have to be careful which clinicians you introduce it to. You need to be a lot more strategic and surgical to find those early adopters who can benefit from an improved ROI and improved throughput and improve the number of patients being seen in a day. You can do it. It's just you have to do it with that mindset. Do not pick a clinician who's on the other end of the spectrum who's going to benefit for a different reason. Then through the journey, my opinion, is you will realize that, yes, you can leverage both, but it's the the, the first one I mentioned, the, the, the improved outcomes, patient satisfaction, provider satisfaction, is really where the true benefit is. Um, the ROI to me is secondary. And believe it or not, we've actually seen many examples where when you introduce it for the human side and the patient side, and the ROI comes, it naturally comes because they do get that extra patient in at the end of the day yes. or they do get the the extra revenue associated with it. And the ROI does come, but that's a leap of faith and good luck selling that to an organization. Yes. It, 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 and, you know, a good example of that would be, imagine you had a clinician who's already working 18 hours a day, let's say, a crazy, crazy schedule. And you said to them, hey, you can keep working 18 hours a day, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that even more efficient so you can see more patients in 18 hours. It's not a great sell if, if they're not happy with 18 hours. So what you're Correct. saying makes total sense. Correct. Total yep. Yep. Exactly. So it's the right. It's like a, it's any tool. It's finding the right person for the right tool. Makes a lot of sense. So Alex, another thing that you brought up in the conversation already is just around change management. And you know, you've been involved with multiple EMR go lives, multiple different technological innovations, and 
initiatives that you've rolled out over the years. And we all know that technology is one part of the equation, but people is another. And so I'm really curious in terms of change management, what have you found to be particularly important? Yeah, so I use a very traditional approach with change management. This is something I've been doing and honed over many, many, many years. And it's now just ingrained in my psyche. Is it's And that some of this goes back to my MBA training is Cotter's eight steps of change management. That's like, I modify it and change it to the scenario a little bit, but that's the foundation. Absolutely starting off with creating that sense of urgency, creating that guiding coalition for the group. Like, why are we doing this? What's the urgency behind it? What's the importance? And then once you find that, getting that leadership, the people that matters, people who can communicate that vision with you, getting them on board. If you don't have that, it's very difficult just to implement change because I told you so, because we told you so. So I always start there. I look for that sense of urgency, that guiding coalition, getting those leaders on board to support it. And if it comes from a leader initially, then that's easier. If it's part of the organization's vision and strategy and leadership is behind it, then you just create that burning platform and that sense of urgency. And then you just go through the steps of finding early adopters, creating broad paced action plans, very tactical plans around it, some short-term wins out of the game, like we just talked about with DAX. You need those short-term wins around ambient technology because otherwise you lose people. And then building on those gains and building on that. Where I've had the most struggles, and this is probably where the biggest lessons learned, I know you didn't ask me this question, but I'm going to ask myself this question, is around the lessons learned. And where I have failed is uh, not implementing it in operations. Where you do it, you get it out there, it's working, and you walk away. And you don't embed it in the day-to-day operations of the organization. Whether it was a nurse triage module I implemented that got working, but it never really was embedded in their operations. So over time, it unraveled. And next thing you know, a year later, as we just did some AI in the ER, and they were using it initially, but it was never embedded in their operations. And we had to recently pull it out because it was just starting to unravel. You, At the end of the day, no matter how successful you are, if you don't embed it in the day-to-day operations and make it sustainable, it's a great win out of the gate, but it's not a permanent change. It becomes more of a novelty than anything else. And when you say embed in the operations, like what does that mean for you exactly? Is it that you're like checking in once a month and, and reviewing how it's going? Is it that, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I would just like open it up. What yeah, so so at the end of the day, this is the example of many organizations. Our organization's a very lean organization. Actually, the last uh, three organizations I've been out have all been very lean focused. And your daily huddles and your daily Kanban boards and your daily workflows, the, da- the metrics you're following as a group are around these initiatives. Then it becomes part of what they're doing on a day-to-day basis. It's something top of mind and kept top of mind, as opposed to just doing it and then having it fade into the background. And then next thing you know, that BPA is turned off because it's considered an annoyance because no one's seeing the benefit as to why you're doing it, or it's on your daily huddle as a topic that you're bringing up. So it's kind of more around, anchor. It's the term Cotter uses is anchoring that change in the organization. And if it doesn't have an anchor, the boat will just drift away. It'll just uh, shift. That reminds me how like um, a similar topic to kind of anchoring where you were building a habit. So I think, for example, for folks who want to, I don't know, like um, make sure they take a certain medication or vitamin every day, if you can anchor that action to something else, like I'm going to take this like medication, like right before I brush my teeth, that's probably a bad example, but if you yeah, can exactly to get a, fl- a workflow, you'll become part of it. But you're right. If you just throw it out there and say, Hey, just do it whenever. <laughs> yep. Or you do uh-huh. it and you said, you know, Josh, you took the medication for the last five days. So we're good with you. Goodbye. If that's... you haven't anchored it in your operations or your culture or your workflows mm-hmm. or whatever, then you know, I can come back in a month and ask you, how's your medication? You're going to go, what medication? <laughs> I thought it was a pilot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Oh, that's good. So Alex, kind of in line with that, I, I wanted to ask, you know, how you go about collecting feedback when you launch a new initiative. And what I mean by that is we know that we need to anchor these programs and have the consistency around how they're performing. And so do you launch something and you know that it's a V1 and you know there's going to be V1.1, 0.2, 0. 0.3, and so on and so forth? Is there sort of a process that you've established for getting on the ground feedback on these new initiatives? Now, I don't actually have a uh, structured approach. To me, it comes down to the success on how much effort I put into my initial KPIs, whether they be survey results or actually hardcore KPIs outcomes. Because if a project is successful and you've picked the right measures, your measures will tell you if it's successful or not. Where you struggle with the outcome of a particular project, the feedback is usually because you picked the wrong measures okay. or you didn't do the due diligence to get the right measures ahead of time. But I would also say, don't downplay the power of anecdotal feedback okay. and what you hear through the, you know, the grapevine and those sorts of things. That's actually real and powerful, <laughs> just a little harder to get, especially in large scale organizations. But that's again, more anecdotal experience. You don't rely on it, but it's important to have. To me, it comes down to the right KPIs from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So you don't, you don't ever put on a, a hat and disguise yourself as undercover boss and- No, no, no. Okay. That's hard for me to do. <laughs> the second I open my mouth, they know exactly who the heck I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, so another question I wanted to get your take on, you've been a CMIO for a long time now, and given how far we've come from paper charting until today, and we're working on, you know, really advanced projects and ambient voice and things like that, how has the role of CMIO evolved over time? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's probably the most interesting question, because again, like when I started, we were on paper charts, CMIO was the, the guy who happened to work as an information systems consultant prior to going to medical school, and they get tapped on the back to implement the first technologies. And it was very change management based at the beginning. That's interesting why you asked me the change management question, and it was just embedded in my psyche, because the original CMIOs were change management specialists. They could get technology implemented in areas where it may have been more difficult, and the people who rose through the ranks before we had fellowships in clinical informatics and board certification in, in clinical informatics, that was the reason why you were successful or not. Well, now it's a lot more structured. There are a lot more opportunities. You can be on the clinical side. There's You can be on the academic side. You can determine your career path a lot earlier on whether you want to be on the academic side of clinical informatics, the clinical side of clinical informatics, et cetera. So it's a lot more structured than it ever was when I started the journey. We had to pay, pave our own way. And initially, when I was meeting with my group of CMIOs, no two people had quite the same role. No, it was a lot of it was driven around organizational culture and that still exists somewhat today, but less so. I would say, argue now it's a, it's a more structured type of career. What I'm interested in is not today's CMIO, it's tomorrow. Where is tomorrow headed? The people who are now graduating medical school and residencies and entering their first jobs, they have to look for the jobs that don't exist yet. And what are those types of jobs? That's the part that I'm most fascinated because that's where I was you know, 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, where are they going to be 25, 30 years from now when I'm sitting on my porch looking out at the world? I had a follow-up to that. You know, what's your stance on how clinical uh, a CMIO should remain? I mean, I've heard a whole mix of, you know, some of them are 10% clinical, other ones are 50-50. What's your thoughts around that? So it, I don't think it matters the number. <laughs> so traditionally it's 20%. I here have a much more uh, administrative role. It's a much bigger role than I'm used to in the past. I'm still clinical. I'm committed to being clinical. I will not give it up because I feel I lose that connection, that understanding, plus the credibility side um, when you're practicing. So I would strongly encourage people to just fight the, the natural need to not practice and to fight it and to continue to practice. Or if you're not practicing, try an opportunity to go back in some way, shape or form, because it does keep you connected to the front line and keep you connected to why you're here and what matters. Because at the end of the day, that's why you're doing this. If you're not, if you're just doing it because it's intellectually curious, 
I'd recommend going to be an information systems consultant and start programming in COBOL. No, just sit, <laughs> you know, because that's basically what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, fair point. So, uh, Alex, thanks again for yep. this conversation. We're going to jump over to what we call the fast five. There's just quick five questions to get to know you better. Yep. The first question we have is what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? So this is an interesting question. I don't read a lot of fiction. Thanks. I'm a lot more into the nonfiction, the academic books. And and one book, and this may take more than a minute to answer, but it <laughs> kind of talks about me and my journey, is Ian Morrison has a book called The Second Curve. And I had read it early on in my journey transitioning from clinical to more administrative work. And it talks about how every industry undergoes a second curve yeah. uh -uh. and where it clicked for me and why I hand it out quite frequently and I ask people to read it is because, and this is a quick story. My father, when I told you he was a influ big influencer of mine and my uncle was a surgeon and whether to go into information systems consulting or not, he was working for a technology company as a member of their strategy team. And he was determining the strategy for that organization for the year 2000. And he said, and I may slip and mention the company's name, so I apologize if I do that, I'm trying not to, is um, he's trying to tell that company, your core business is gonna go to zero in the year 2000. And they're like, wait, what do you mean our core business is gonna go to zero in the year 2000? There is all the factors that are driving our original business model are going away. We have to come up with a second curve. That company's still in existence. Uh -huh. It reinvented its business model and it's in a similar but very different line of work today. But it's uh -huh. because they understood what I now realize is that second curve. And whether it's the new consumers that are entering the market, whether it's the new technologies that are entering the market, or new markets opening up, those three factors, when they come together, they create a second curve. Okay. And I think today, healthcare is entering that second curve. Okay. I was always waiting because I saw my father and with his company going through that second curve. I've seen other industries there. You know, like once I said this, so people are going, well, I can think of an examples of companies who either survived that transition to the second curve or didn't survive that second curve. I think healthcare is actually entering their second curve because you have the factors. You have new consumers who have a very different expectation out of healthcare than you ever did. They're no longer tolerant of all the nuances and idiosyncrasies of healthcare. They want it now, they want it fast, they want it right, they want it personalized. We, like we just talked about for the last 45 minutes, there's a whole slew of new technologies, ambient technologies, artificial intelligence, you name it, we've finally transitioned healthcare out of paper into a, a framework that we can now start to leverage these new technologies and there's new markets growing mm -hmm. up. There's virtual healthcare, which never really existed a few years ago. Um, the patient no longer has to be geographically centered. Healthcare is entering new markets and you have people delivering healthcare who would have never thought of delivering healthcare a few years ago. So I think that whole transition to that second curve. So that book, Ian Morrison, just even though I read it many, many years ago is now ringing true in my head. So I tend to give it out quite a bit and try and try to recommend it to people. Yeah, I love that. I'm so curious what this company is. I'm just kidding. I, I was I'm not thinking, just saying. I'm, I'm yeah. just saying. It was, it was the Xerox, Xerox Corporation. They were a it, copier company. Yeah. They were yeah. embedded in a very traditional type of technology. And now they're the document company. Yeah, that's right. And as yeah. you can imagine, copiers were not the thing to be staying in as your core business. You could still right. create copiers, but it can't be your core business. Yeah. You need to develop a different mindset with their business. And now they're the document company. Uh -huh. So, Yeah. So God, I said, that's awesome. no, no, yeah. <laughs> a question two that we have, who is a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? So that's an interesting one. And uh, the other people have asked me that similar type of question and it gets a little philosophical for me. I would love to go back and meet Gandhi or one of those leaders who were able to transcend conceptually what is around us <laughs> physically and able to carry on a mission or a vision or a journey in a way that's more seeking the truth than just trying to navigate the worldly struggles in a way that we're predetermined okay. to navigate them. There aren't many out there, they exist. You know, Gandhi just happens to be one that I found initially fascinating. So if I could go back and just spend some time with him and try to crawl in his head, that would be awesome. I, <laughs> who knows? 
But yeah, so yeah, somebody like Gandhi would be the person I'd love to meet just to understand that whole concept. Very cool. Yeah. Three is a bit different. Would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? So being a physician, the last thing I want to do is get into people's minds. <laughs> that you know, just just interacting with, you know, is, is it difficult. So it's not getting in people's minds. Super strength to me is very self-serving. It's just, it's super speed. Uh-huh. It's to be able to do what I do, I have to move fast. Uh-huh. And I have to move faster than the next person to be successful. Technology by nature requires speed. It's the whole definition of it. So for me, if I had to pick one of the three, it would be super speed, but that's to survive in the world today. It's not for self-serving. Okay. Meeting Gandhi's for self-serving reasons. Super speed is for career success, yeah. and career yeah. ambitions. Love it. Right, question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? So for me, healthcare, the thing that I always question being a technology person is in healthcare, in residency, it was always do one, see one, do one, teach one. And it was one. <laughs> you create an AI algorithm, it's see billions or millions or see as much as you can to learn to start to do, but you really do based, and you do better based on thousands and thousands okay. and thousands of interactions and learning before you even begin to teach it. So the whole concept, I know I know why it's done because there's a lot to be said for experience and there's a lot to be said for that whole autonomy, not experience, that whole journey of autonomy and the need for have that self-confidence and that self-autonomy. I don't wanna downplay that part of it, but in the end, to actually see one in the true sense of the word, then do it, and then now be an expert and start teaching it, just blew my mind that that was actually a concept that would work in terms of a, a high reliable, high quality environment. It just it never made sense to me. Yeah. Well, you, you know, one day you won't you won't do anything because the AI will just do everything for you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You'll just be seeing it. Yeah. You'll be just observing it happening and never get to doing it or teaching yeah. it. That's great. The last question that we have, if you could travel back in time to any event or moment, what would it be and why? Yeah, so that that's a that's a, a tough one. I was originally thinking that it's not a moment in time, but if I could go back to my childhood yeah. and fix the mistakes yeah. <laughs> that I made and know what I know now back then, yeah. I, the world would be a very different place now because I'd be a, a much different person. But again, it's all part of your journey. Yeah. But yeah, to be able to go back in time, learn what I learned, and then kind of do it over again, it would be awesome Definitely. to be able to have that vision now. Um, but that is what it is. Yeah, I love that. We would maybe be all using ambient voice already. You yeah, bring exactly. that in the way back when. Exactly. <laughs> or I, I would have, just quick funny story to that end is when I was a roommate after college with my colleague at my consulting company that I was, he was showing me America Online and how this is the wave of the future and I should invest in this company and the internet is the wave of the future and you got to do it. And I'm like, nah, you're crazy. <laughs> this is not going to work. Banking online, that ain't ever going to happen. Well, guess what? He's retired now and I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, going back in time to those moments would be also yeah. very That's right. well. so, <laughs> This is uh, like, back, like the back to the future thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But that's, uh, that's a different reason. That's a selfish reason and for not a benefit mankind type of reason. Right. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's great. Well, awesome. Thank you, Alex, for spending some time with us. You've definitely given us a lot of wisdom throughout the conversation that I hope our audience can take away little nuggets from. Um, that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient, hosted by SeamlessMD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Uh, Alex, Dr. Patron, again, thank you so much. No, thank you, Alan and Josh. Much appreciated. Enjoyed the time and the conversation. It was great.